The subject of this hearing, and this is actually the second of three hearings that the Committee of the Whole is having today, the third hearing to follow this hearing when we're done. The subject of this hearing is Bill 20-677, D.C. Urban Farming and Food Security Act of 2014. Bill 20-677 was introduced, co-introduced by Council Members Grasso, Wells, and Che at our legislative meeting on February 4th of this year and was co-sponsored by myself and Council Members Bowser and McDuffie. The uh, Bill 20-677 contains a number of sections. Sections 4 and 5 amend the tax code by establishing a food donation tax credit and a real property tax abatement. Sections 2 and 3 of the bill amend the Food Production and Urban Gardens Program Act of 1986, which is codified in Title 48 of the D.C. Code. The purpose of Sections 2 and 3 is to establish an urban farming land leasing initiative whereby qualified district applicants will be selected to develop at least 25 district-owned vacant lots for the purpose of urban agriculture. The bill specifies that all lease agreements entered into under this initiative shall be for a term of at least three years and that any lease with an independent farm or farm cooperative may permit the sale of fresh fruits and vegetables on the leased land. That's a quick summary of the legislation. My goal is to foster a robust conversation around food security and sustainability. That is why I have partnered with the Open Government Foundation to promote transparency. Using the Madison platform, this bill, as well as others, have been uploaded to spur community engagement and allow district residents to comment and offer input. We have received feedback already, which I will be incorporating today, and I encourage anyone watching from home to log in and join the conversation. We will be accepting questions throughout today's hearing, and while I will not be able to ask them all, I do encourage everyone to utilize this platform and continue to stay engaged on this and other issues. A truly sustainable food system encourages local food production and distribution opportunities that make nutritious food accessible and affordable to all district residents. With this legislation, we will continue to improve food availability, food access, and food use, and I'm eager to hear from and engage with all of the witnesses in the discussion to follow. Thank you very much, Chairman Mendelson. Um, as I noted in my opening, I had some um, interaction on this legislation online, which is um, a kind of a new way to go about doing this. And I wanted to just um, mention a couple of questions that came off of that effort. Um, and you guys might be able to help me answer. One of them came from Ms. Or I don't know if it's a man or a woman, Alexander Moore on Madison when she, they asked that it may be important to mandate um, kind of end use reporting if this is city property on kind of the use of the property um, and we kind of can better understand what's being done there over the long run and the impact it's having on the city. So if our purpose here is to have more farming and more vegetables locally produced and, you know, kind of get the blight out, how do we go back and look and make sure that actually happened? I don't know if any of you have any thoughts on the reporting, maybe putting in more reporting requirements. I guess my first question would be what reporting requirements the city has for anyone who leases property from the city, which there's quite a bit on the city rolls. Right, there and is. And I think that there should be parity. I mean, I, I'm okay with this end use reporting requirements, definitely. If we're saying we want to take blighted property and turn it into something beautiful, there needs to be some way of measuring it, which is really difficult. You could talk about how many pounds you donated, um, but that I worked at a nonprofit farm for almost six years, and we measured our donations in pounds, and I think there's a limitation to that because that means I'm always giving potatoes potatoes and turnips and you know nobody who's getting donated produce ever gets to eat lettuce and that's just not a fair way of measuring it so you know there's some limitations to that but my first question would be what's happening in other places right I, I, I agree and I think it's something we should look at another question we got was around the use of pesticides or other harmful chemicals and whether or not they should be uh, prohibited C. Kalen uh, asked this question on Madison as well and I'm just curious what you guys think about that we don't prohibit it we obviously are trying to let the farmer be a farmer in the way they want but um, I would support that my farm I grew up on was an all-organic farm and I don't know if that's something we would want to try to uh, include in the law yeah we talked about this the last time when we talked about um, chickens and goats and other things that um, uh, maybe we could take a cue from our neighbors in other states and just kind of transplant their 
services and ideas and information. These are kinds of things like the District of Columbia is kind of in a vacuum. And when we try to think about how to create urban agriculture in the city, we really need to realize that there's a lack of infrastructure here that this bill is not going to solve. In Maryland, the State Department of Agriculture and the Department of Health, all of these state-led institutions are already designed to regulate you know, pesticide use, run off into the Chesapeake Bay, all of these things. The Potomac and the Anacostia is running into the bay. So, yeah, of course, whatever the other states have already put into regulations in, in terms of making sure that farms are not just sending, you know, nitrogen and phosphorus into the bay, that's so easy. We can just have the same legislation here. I think that makes a lot of sense. And I, I don't know if that's, if this is the bill to do that. You know, it, it, it may not be. And it may be something broader on an agricultural attempt, you know, once we get really going in this, in this concept. Um, I think some of the requirements we already put around this bill, um, you know, that there be some experience that be local, you know, all that will keep it in that regard. Um, I also wanted to note, uh, you know, I think it would be, you know, Mr. Um, Schneider, I know that you actually participated on the Madison, mm -hmm. and I appreciate that. And you asked some really good questions around nonprofits. And, and then the rooftop question is an interesting one. I'm not sure um, you'd be competing, I think, with the solar energy folks quite a bit. But that's okay. I don't mind that competition. But the point is I just I, I don't understand at this point why GSA couldn't just do that. We probably didn't include rooftops mostly because I didn't think about it, but also because um, it's not necessarily a blighted spot, so it didn't fix one of my big points of this bill. And I, I'm happy to have you uh, kind of expound on that if you want a little bit. I've talked with uh, Paul Lanning, who works for Bluefin, and they've done the survey and analysis of all the DGS-owned uh, roofs in the city. Uh, we don't look at it so much as competing against solar, but as a potential opportunity to leverage roofs that, A, don't meet the criteria for holding um, solar panels, um, don't have the roof life expectancy. Um, the wonderful thing about our approach is that it can be moved, it can be temporary, it's lightweight. So this is uh, just one more tool in the, in the shed to increase the district's capacity to grow locally grown food. I think that's interesting. I, you know, there's a couple points on this I think are important to note. The uh, the homeowner property conversation is a little bit harder because it's harder <laughs> to combat fraud there. When we're talking about tax incentives like this, it's much more difficult for us to manage it from a regulatory side. It's also important, um, the reason nonprofits aren't in here is because we're giving tax breaks. Uh, and so it would be a different incentive base to get them to be engaged. Um, I'm talking about nonprofit farms, you know, and so um, that's kind of a little bit more complicated, although it could be done. I just didn't, wasn't my priority at the time. Um, so I have one last question while I have you at the, the table. I want to kind of understand, and this is another Madison question, what is the kind of definition for you guys of what a successful farm is? You know, you heard my definition. You heard what I talked about around mass production and bringing food locally, you know, creating it locally for local consumption. What's a successful farm? How much money do you have to make? Where does the food have to go? All those conversations. I'll give you the rest of my time to talk about that. I think that's a hard question to ask. I mean, everybody knows I keep beating the, um, the drum of productive farm means that I'm growing a lot of vegetables, that I'm making enough money to pay myself and my crew a living wage. Um, that there's something tangible. I can put fresh produce on a table and feel really good about it and live in dignity. And yet, you know, every time I'm at the farm, there's this kind of body and soul healing that happens that's totally intangible and surprises me. Two weeks ago, a woman who lives in the neighborhood came through the gate and stood in front of me, with me in front of a fig tree that I planted last fall and had this tender moment. We shared a devotion that she had in her bag and she told me about a hard conversation she had had with a friend the day before and she left there feeling healed and gave me a $20 donation. She was just totally inspired. To me, being a farm and successful in the city means that we're touching people's lives and healing their bodies and souls. You know, I'll tell you, when I was a kid and we were on a 65-acre farm out in Virginia in Loudoun County, my, uh, my family did all organic farming. We had animals, we had vegetable garden and everything, and we had enough vegetables there to get, give it away a lot of food. But I also know that it wouldn't have been possible to do that if it weren't for my father being a dentist and living and working in uh, Roslyn, Virginia every day. He rode in an hour and did his dental practice and came back out. And when my parents divorced, 
um, you know, we had to sell the farm because my dad no longer lived there and my mom wouldn't take his money, so um, we sold the farm. Now, that was not sustainable. That was not necessarily a plan. Could we have done it? Probably, right? I think if we had, if our commitment had been to have a living farm there, it would have been doable because we had the land and we had the, the facilities with the great barn and everything. But the, the fact is it takes a lot more, I think, to embrace urban farming is going to take these other aspects that you're talking about. It's not just about the bottom dollar, although that's very important. It has to have more to it that makes it a part of, uh, integral part of the community. Yeah, and I don't know how to write a report that says that. <laughs> well, you're going to have to figure it out. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, each of you, for your testimony. And again, um, if you want your statement for the record, please uh, provide it in writing.